So today we'll be talking about transfer student and um, kind of what we, we do with a student who transfers to us um, from a different teacher. Um, when I taught a lot before I was a college professor, that was my least favorite thing to do is to accept a transfer student. I really disliked that because I had to fix so many different things that I didn't like, musically, technically. I had to make sure that they are playing safely so they don't injure themselves. And I don't know if you have taught yet. Have you taught already a little bit? Yeah, and have you taught like older um, students? So you, can, you, you know already what I'm talking about, right? So there are all those complicated issues that come with that. And so when I was doing my doctorate degree, I said, never again, I will teach a transfer student. Just never, right? Of course, I was wrong because then I got a, a position at Heidelberg University, and uh, which meant that every single student that I teach is transfer student just by nature because they start at Heidelberg um, at college with me. Uh, it's gonna work maybe like this so I started kind of digging into it and finding if anyone ever wrote about a transfer student and so I found some information um, it wasn't completely satisfying it just proved what I already knew but here are some of the sources that I did find um, that various uh, pedagogy um, uh, people um, said about that so we have um, Ruth Slancheska who is actually an excellent, um, she was an excellent pedagogue. She says, I feel that I can count on fair degree of success with students I start from their very first lesson, but I need help with students who transfer to me from other teachers. Many of them are poor readers, careless musicians, and have little or no technique. But most importantly, they are playing music way over their heads and don't know it. So this is one of the sources. Um, another um, interesting quote but by the same teacher, the habit of poor reading with, no, with too quick, faulty memorizing causes frustration that curtails musical exploration, growth, and enjoyable performance. Marian Usler says, um, solving specific problem or eliminating certain deficiencies may not present as much challenge as being able to teach the transfer student and at a number of levels simultaneously. And especially when you are a less experienced teacher, you will see that you would want to fix a lot of things at the same time. And that might be actually quite challenging because you cannot fix everything in one session or two sessions. Yes, it's a process that requires time. And finally, Marta Baker Jordan says special assessment procedures and perhaps different initial teaching techniques will be called for because this student usually comes with excess baggage that is often a challenge to even the best and most experienced teachers. And so here um, the pedagogy, this pedagogy um, person, uh, Marta Baker Jordan, um, clearly states that you need a process. She's identifying that there has to be a different process for a transfer student. That we cannot treat a transfer student the same way we treat a complete beginner, whether adult or um, a young student. And so uh, Marta Baker Jordan, um, in her book, Practical Piano Pedagogy, does offer that assessment, that document that you can actually follow and make an assessment of the student, evaluate the student and see the strengths, the weaknesses, what students need to work on. This is the form um, that I copied from the book. And you see that there are, it's quite basic form, right? The student name, age, um, conversation starter questions to student, comments. So it's quite a basic kind of form that you can retrieve later for your record. Students choices for repertoire audition. Um, it didn't quite give me the depth that I was looking for to evaluate the student. And uh, so, of course, there is uh, also a test uh, on the bottom. It says technique. Um, and how they did in that area, musical terms, do they know some of them, do they not, sight reading, and general comments overall. This is the um, 
readiness evaluation that you can give to a student, of course you would tailor that according to the age of the student and how many years the student has studied piano. Um, but that is just an example, again, from the same, same source, similar to a theory. Okay, but it still was not satisfying enough for me. And so I decided to take a look at the things a little bit different, kind of upside down, and have a complete white uh, uh, piece of paper and deciding, okay, how, how can I approach this uh, subject? And so I started comparing the two. Why do I feel so comfortable when I teach a beginner student? And why do I feel so uncomfortable when it comes to a transfer student? Really, any transfer student, why does it always make me feel out of place? And so what I discovered... Can't <laughs> oh, yes, time to panic! And why panic? Because I actually did not have my starting point anymore. Or where did my starting point go? When a five-year-old or a six-year-old comes to my studio, I know exactly what to do. They don't have any previous knowledge. I choose a method that I think is appropriate for that uh, particular student. Of course, I interview with the family, but I know exactly the steps that I have to take in order to get them started. With the transfer student, I have no idea. It's a blank slate. They come and a lot of the students would say, especially teenagers, their parents will say, oh, my child is very gifted, which means that's kind of a red flag right there um, that you, you probably have to assess it much more carefully. And so I realized that I have to find common ground. So meeting the student where they are. I had to find as much information as possible about what they already know. How is their reading skills? How is their technique? What are some of the musical um, ideas they already acquired? Can they interpret by themselves? Can they learn a piece of music by themselves? Do they know how to practice? That's a big one. Uh, in most cases, they don't. Um, so I really needed to create some sort of form to address all of those uh, things and to find something that I can base my teaching off. So I created this assessment, square one assessment. Um, and it's important to note that this square one assessment is tailored to each individual teacher. Like my square one assessment will be completely different than yours. Um, so just kind of, I'm going to show you that, that document and we are going to go from there. So the ideas that it tries to address, um, the document is, where is the student in their studies? Are the student, or are you ready to accept the, uh, are you as a teacher ready to accept the student? Is your studio a good fit for the student? That's a very important one, because what if the student is too advanced? Come on in. or quite the opposite, not too advanced, or maybe he's not as dedicated as your studio. So thank you for joining us. We're talking about a square one assessment that we're creating for transfer students. Um, and are your goals aligned with the goals of the student? That is a very important one as well. Why is that important? Because if your goals are different than that of a student, you actually cannot teach, right? If your goal is for the student to compete and they don't want to compete, the, fit, the, the match is probably not very good. Is the student ready to join your studio and committing to the designed plan? So you will design some sort of pedagogical plan that you can share with the students and the parents. And what are the short and long-term goals for the student? And that's perhaps the punchline there. What are some of the goals that you can create for the student that would match their own? And so in short, we try to embrace what the student knows and what the student should know, right? So uh, if before I was kind of uh, accepting the student in the studio and I didn't know uh, a lot of information and I would just expect them to know certain things and then I would get frustrated if they didn't know, now I just embrace it as a whole and I say, okay, so this is where we start and let's climb from this point on. Let's move forward from here on. 
So um, as I said before, square one assessment is relative to your own studio. And it has four different parts. So here are the four different parts that I will be assessing or evaluating each student, each transfer student that comes my way, whether actually college or, or just a private student. So musical literacy, technique, musicianship, and practice habits. And so I'm going to break those down in a minute, and maybe we can even have a little bit, uh, a little, a little bit of discussion what each category um, might have in it. So let's uh, look at music uh, literacy first. And so in music literacy, I would have three different grades for a student. The first one is exceeds expectations. So if I have a seven-year-old who can easily sight read any sort of music that they put in front of them, they probably exceeded my expectations, right? Two is proficient. It's, again, it's according to your studio. If I expect a seven-year-old to know all their notes and be able to read at a basic level, they're proficient, right? And one is not proficient, and that's a very common example when you get a 10-year-old student who's been playing for five years and doesn't know their notes. Obviously, he's not proficient. So here's, uh, here are some of the consideration points for musical literacy. So of course, notes, rhythm, Fingering, articulation, such as non legato, legato, staccato. Does the student recognize those? More than that, can he actually play those? Yes, even though articulation will go into the technical part, how to do it. Terminology, theory and harmony for a little bit older age, oral training, form, again for older, a little bit of an older student, voicing. I mean, really, the list can go on and on and on. Um, but those lists you would create for each category in your studio. So suggestions for a plan. Um, so let's say you are interviewing and assessing a student who is not proficient and who needs help. So here are some of the suggestions that um, you might uh, include. So first of all, weekly attention. And this is something that has to be ingrained in their long-term memory. Considering that piano lessons in this country are once a week, unfortunately, um, right? So, and a lot of kids are busy with a lot of different activities. It's very hard for them to memorize anything really, right? And do anything beyond, beyond what they do in the class. So weekly attention, is necessary. That means that if after four weeks you see that the child is proficient in notes and he knows all those notes, it does not necessarily mean that in eight weeks he will, sti he will still know those notes, right? And retain the information. So you have to constantly sort of come back to it all the time. And uh, you can incorporate in the note reading, of course, technology, like there are a lot of apps that drill notes. Um, that's something that kids even can do at home if the parents allow in screen time. Flashcards and games, again, something that could be done outside of the class. That's why it's kind of helpful. Theory class, I know that some private teachers do a theory class, usually once a month, so, but still, reinforcement. And then extra help. So if you have like a large studio and you have seniors in your studio, you can actually incorporate them so they help the younger kids um, succeed and um, give that weekly attention that they need to improve their literacy. Okay, this is probably one of the most controversial topics of all times. Um, you go on Facebook, on groups, and you will hear, this is wrong, no, this is wrong, no, this is wrong, no, this is right, no, my way is right, no, he's twisting his, his hand, no, the wrist is too low, oh, no, he's breaking the bridge, why are the fingers lifting so high? I mean, really, the sky is the limit, and the technique is really, uh, the bottom line is, for me, is, is the student hurting themselves or not, right? That's kind of good technique and bad technique, and so, here are the four points that I assess my students with. The number four is healthy in your style. And what does it mean in your style? So every single person here that teaches, you acquire your own style. It's the way you were taught. Like I was taught in Russian school. Um, someone else might be studying in China. Someone else in America. You know, if the result is great, 
great, fine, right? But that's my own style. That does not mean that the final accomplishment, the final product has to be done in my style, right? So healthy in your style, this is like the best case scenario that I very rarely see, <laughs> especially with younger children. Um, then the next one down, healthy technique, but not in your style. Somebody who studied with American teacher, for example, and I'm Russian, and they come to me and it's still very fluent, the hands are free, they're using their arm weight properly, there is no tension, right? But it's not exactly how I would teach it. Then number two is unhealthy technique in your style. Now can you think of an example, what, who, who, how would that look? Somebody who has unhealthy technique and they're still trained in my style. Because I just said that I think my style is pretty good, right? <laughs> Everyone probably will think the same about their own style. This is a very complicated question, I think. But um, basically it talks about teachers who, let's say, have been teaching for 20 years in one style, and then all of a sudden they were inspired by a different style, and they said, oh, I'm going to try to switch now. And they don't get enough education in that new style, and they start teaching like that. And you receive a student from that teacher. So it's kind of right, but kind of not. It's like in between. So it's sort of in your style, but it's not done correctly. Right? And then, of course, worst case scenario is unhealthy, not in your style. This is somebody who is clearly on the road to either hurt themselves or cannot produce the sound they want. They start pushing um, into instruments. And I always tell my students, don't fight the piano. Piano is much bigger. It will actually defeat you. <laughs> so you have to work um, healthily with that. So uh, consideration points for technique. So here are some that I observe uh, when I um, you know, listen to students for the first time. Sitting position, posture, hand position, alignment. What is alignment? Do you guys know what alignment means? You can say no or yes. <laughs> no? Okay, alignment is when we have a hand and I'm trying to align that. Like I have three points, if I could show you this way maybe, right? One, two, and three. And so that has to be sort of in straight alignment versus like this. Yeah, versus like twisted like that or twisted other way, yeah? And so other way it's of course uh, very small. Now why, why is it not good to play like this? Maybe somebody can tell me. Excuse me, like this? Yes. For a long time, yeah, like, like this. It takes a lot of tension on the wrist and it's Exactly. Nervous. Yes, you're cutting circulation, right? And also when you do this a lot, uh, many, many times, your body will start uh, saying like, I do not like that. And when the body says, I don't like that, usually there's inflammation. That's the first sign of like, you need to stop. You need to see what's going on, right? And so if you're starting to experience pain anywhere, that's a bad sign. This is this little tunnel, right? What can happen in here? Carpal, carpal tunnel, yes. So um, each time when you twist the hand like this, right? If the tendons get irritated, they will swell up. If they swell up, they will start touching the nerves. And that's where the pain might come, yeah? So this kind of alignment, we call that like twisting, for example, right? Um, another bad alignment that would be if you have an elbow that is too close to your body and the student plays like this. That's a bad thing as well. And then um, sound. Now, why is sound in technique category? What do you think? Versus in music, musical. Right, yeah. If somebody is trying to, 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 to play a lot of sound and they're very tense, the sound will just not come out, right? It's like you are uh, strangling somebody. Articulation, like uh, you have to see if students know actually how to play legato or staccato. I mean, there are real clear ways to play those things, right? Um, 
there is there's a piano over there, but I'm just going to demonstrate here. But so legato, for example, if the student plays like this. This will not be connected, right? Even though the notes are connected, this is not connected. So articulation is wrong. Um, of course, velocity is part of technique. Scales, can they play fluently? Or when they play a scale, does it look like this? I'm exaggerating, but I have seen a lot of that, yeah? So the thumb, and of course the thumb is the most complicated uh, finger ever. <laughs> That's like a whole different lecture. And then, of course, etudes. So you might want to inquire if the student have played any etudes. So I just recently, like last year, had a student that emailed me and he's 16 years old. And he's like, could you please take me into your studio? And I was like, okay, well, let's meet. And so we met and he was playing Transcendental Etude uh, by Liszt. And it was uh, horrendous, absolutely horrendous. So, um, and I asked him, I actually couldn't watch it physically. I was like, oh my gosh, this kid is just going to hurt himself by the end of this attitude, right? So I asked him, what attitudes have you played before? And you know what his answer was? This is my first one. This is a red flag, like right there, right? Um, and so with students like that, it's just actually very difficult to change something because they're kind of on their own sort of line and they don't know what they're supposed to be doing. Okay. Um, suggestions for a plan. The first one came with experience. So if you take anything from today's lecture, you should take the first one. Assign pieces few levels easier than whatever the student is playing. Whenever they play for you, first of all, you should ask how long it took them to learn it, because it might be that they've been playing this piece for a whole year, and that's not a good sign either, right? Whatever they play, at whatever level they are, you should really go a few levels easier so you can choose, you can uh, change some of the habits that they acquired. You have to divide concepts. You have to be very specific about what you teach. You have to explain why. Even when they're six years old or seven years old, they're actually very smart little individuals. Video record. Now, why would I want to video record poor technique? Yes, of course. So if you're explaining something to the student and they, okay, and then you say, okay, now let's record it and let's watch that, it will take you about five minutes. And with technology today, it's not a problem at all the student immediately sees what's wrong and actually fixing it much faster that way, especially when it's alignment issue, very quick. And then watching others helps. Now, others who? Who can they watch? Like classmates. Classmates. Uh. We have this incredible resource online, starts with letter Y. YouTube, very good. And so I would assign actual uh, YouTube clips with good technique and bad technique. And we would uh, talk about that and evaluate that. And so when they watch others, they actually start understanding what I'm talking about. And hopefully we'll have time to watch a few examples um, here. Okay, musicianship. This is probably not controversial, but it's a very difficult um, category. Can somebody tell me why why is it difficult? Musicianship. Music is music. Music is uh, our like tongue, right? Like language. Why? Why is it a difficult category? So, like when you compete at a competition, do you always agree with the comments that the judge makes for you? Right. That's a that's an interesting question because I. Uh, Sometimes when you compete the uh, competition, the judges' comments are totally different. Yes. Yeah, some, that happens a lot. R exactly. So yeah. back to my question then. Why is musicianship so difficult to address? Because abstract. it's abstract, yeah. Different people have taste. style. Taste. Yeah, different style, different taste, different education, different views, different backgrounds, yes? There's a lot of different things. Hello. Um, so um, that's why that category is kind of difficult to, to pinpoint. And so here are the four categories that I kind of proposed to, to have 
Oh, please take a seat. I'm going to take my coat so you can actually take a seat here. Here you go. Um, and so the first one is above average. It's really, I mean, you have to be truly above average to get that score. It's like not only you play beautifully and in style, you also have your own kind of, you know, your own signature, your own something that you're giving to music. Basic level, that's a very good category to be in. That's most of the students that are talented or advanced would land there. Underdeveloped. Underdeveloped is basically they do not hear that dominant has to the, you know, resolve into tonic. So tonic would be softer. Some very basic things like after a long note, the next note is not going to be accented, right? Like end of the phrase will be always soft. Some very basic things that at that point when they are uh, like not when they're six, but if they're arriving to, to you when they're 15 or even 10 or 12, some of those things already should be there. For the very little ones, what could be underdeveloped? For we're talking about, let's say they took two years of piano. What could be underdeveloped in musicianship? Well, how about sound? If they play everything with the same sound, with the same tone, right? We always say, we meaning teachers, that there should be no two notes that sound exactly the same that are next to each other. If you play legato, I don't care how you play legato, but they have to connect, not only physically, but also by ear, right? And so that's kind of the under underdeveloped um, category that I'm talking about. And the hardest one out of all assessments, out of everything developed in a different style. Now, what, what is that? What, what do you think? Who, who could, could be fitting that kind of category? You can say, don't be scared. <laughs> the or I mean the student. It, it would be, a well, it would be an adult student most likely, right? Somebody who is older, right? And who all his life was trained in a different style. Like, for example, if a jazz musician, let's say, right, trained somebody to play classical music, that's not a very good uh, example because a lot of jazz musicians actually come from classical, um, you know, background. But let's say that student all his life only heard hip hop right, and all those beats that are very even, right, and he's trying to play four release like that. I mean, you're going to start climbing the walls. It's going to be horrible. And so this is the most difficult thing to fix because they actually have a very different sound in their ears, very different than anything else. Also, I'm talking about kids who have been in a small studio all their lives, have never been exposed to anything, and all they heard is that kind of mediocre sort of level, not very good level of artistry, and that's all they know. That's all they know. They don't know anything better. And so that is that. So which some of the points we can um, take for consideration when we're talking about musicianship? So I'll start, like voicing, for example. Right? When we play a chord, the top should be voiced. What else? I mean, worst case scenario, you say something wrong, it's okay. Phrasing, phrasing of course, the most basic, yeah, phrasing, of course. What else? Absolutely, yeah. Harmonic language, right? All the harmony and how do they, yes, that will affect musicianship. Color, change. color changes, right? How they react to color or can they react to color? Do they hear that? Oftentimes they don't, actually, yeah. How about something between left and right hand? Balance. Balance, Balance is one of the hardest things to teach, actually, to a young child because it takes a different level of um, skill. 
So here, here are things. We addressed um, a lot of those are already. Of course, terminology, yeah, what the composer asks. Style and historical understanding. This is comes to that category where they're playing in a different style. I don't know, hopefully you have never heard that before, when somebody plays Mozart's sonata, but it sounds like it's Chopin. With so much rubato and so much hesitation, and you are like, oh my god, why is this, why, why? It's because they actually don't understand that different things played in different styles should be played differently, right? Um, articulation, of course, part of musicianship. Sound, attention to the score, that's a big one, attention to the score, because actually all of the interpretation, everything is already written. You just need to know how to read it. Timing, balance, and pedal. Pedal is a huge one. Why? It makes different sound, but pedal is directly connected to, to your ear. So if the student's ear is underdeveloped and they're playing with pedal, it's not going to bother them if they put tonic and supertonic, like the first and second you know, notes on one pedal. It will just not make any difference for them and will probably drive you crazy because you are not used to that. So suggestions for a plan. Um, so first one is, of course, listening is the key. More music you can introduce to your students by different performance, better th that is. If you have uh, your own studio, um, you might want to consider a closed like Facebook group for parents and students that can listen together where you post videos every week. You might even consider comparing two videos and asking, well, this is, I don't want to use for a list, but let's say this is Schumann Arabesque, right? And this is Marta Argish playing and this is Rubinstein. What, what are some of the differences? How, wh what, what do you think about that? And so that discussion, especially if you have a once in a while a studio class, that, that's a great thing to do. So that's the social group. Um, I actually wrote a little article about that. Um, if you're interested, you can uh, read about that. All right, and then of course exposure, 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 right? So AMT has actually a little magazine for uh, little kids, Piano Explorer, where they have a lot of assignments and fun activities where they uh, let the, the students be, um, you know, exposed to different um, ideas and things. And they even do like little listening examples there. They have a puzzle there. It's a crossword. It's very interesting. One of my favorite magazines of all time, especially if you're a performance major, International Piano Magazine. How many of you know about this? You must subscribe, this is, this is gold. This talks about all competitions. It talks about the winners of all the competitions. It talks about how to win those competitions. <laughs> it's like, it's more for piano performance than actually for pedagogy maybe, even though, of course, the two fields are connected. This is a fantastic uh, quality magazine. The next one is, um, well, I'm going to skip down Deborah scene, playing beyond the notes. This is for an adult student or older student who can actually read and process information on their own. Um, and it talks about interpretation and stuff in a very concise, very clear way. Um, and then what did I, I actually also missed the piano magazine, the piano magazine or formal uh, clavier companion. Um, that's that's dire directed towards pedagogy. And um, this month, we both actually have articles in there. So that's kind of cool. Um, and last but not the least, field trips. If you have the time and resources to take your students to field trip, there is no substitution for that. It's just incredible. If you have young kids, they have the Rainbow Series in Cleveland or in Toledo, they have those little concerts. If you have older kids, like yourself, <laughs> all, all the older students, just go to those performances. We live in a w wonderful place where we can actually get to every possible location. Okay, practice habits. This is uh, Emma when she was little and she never slept and that's why she looks like this. Uh, I looked probably similar to that. I just didn't take a picture of that. So practice habits, 
Basically, I assume that the students don't know how to practice. Whenever a student comes to me from anywhere, I just, they don't know how to practice. And so here are the three categories that I have for them, but I just automatically go to one, actually. And so practice routine aligned with your studio policies. So if you are teaching privately, hopefully you have a policy that says your child has to practice every day the amount of lessons, so like 45 minutes or 30 minutes or 20, depends on age, depends on what you want, uh, but you have some sort of policy in place so that parents know what to do. Practice routine exists but differs from your studio policy. What is that? What do you think? Practice routine exists but is different from what you have in mind. They practice the right hand. Yes. Then they practice the left hand. Yes, or they, they pra or, or they have a bathroom break every three minutes. Or they say they practice, but actually the environment they are practicing in is so chaotic that it's impossible to concentrate. And I had a student um, a few years ago, and he was eight years old, and his mom sweared. She's like, he's practicing every day. I don't know why there is no progress. I'm like, okay, can you videotape one of the practice sessions? He has five siblings, and they're all in the same room. Some of them has the TV on. The other one has a video game going on, like an iPad. You know, it's complete chaotic mess. And then there is a puppy running across. And it's, yeah, it's like, of course, yeah, he's practicing, but that's not what we call practice, right? And then, of course, number one, we just talked about. So I have to say a little bit about parental involvement, and now I'm a parent myself, and my older daughter is taking piano lessons, imagine that, uh, and violin lessons. And so it's actually very difficult. And so for piano lessons, I don't have any problem because, dude, I know how to play the piano. Okay, If there's one thing I know, it's how to practice piano if I don't know anything else. But violin, oh my god, that is a whole different level of practicing. I do not know what is going on there. What do you mean posture? What do you mean like this way? Oh, the bow. Oh, wait, wait, this cannot go like that. And wait, and at the same time, it has to be clean. Wait, watch your second finger. Watch your head. Why is it slinging? Oh, why are you... And all that, I had to... Huh? They haven't played a single note yet. No, and they didn't play a single note yet, right? And all that, I supposed to monitor when she practices, right? So now I'm starting to think like, oh my gosh. This is what piano parents experience, <laughs> those that don't know anything about piano. And so we have to sort of educate them and be very kind to them, right? But at the same time, we have to ask the right questions even before they come to us. So how many times a week the student practices? You have to ask that of a parent. And some might say, oh, what do you mean? Every day, of course. How long are the practice sessions? How does the student divide his practice session, right? What is the student's practice environment? Huge one. How does the student approach a new piece? And when I say student, here I'm talking about younger age, right? Because I'm talking about how parents help or can help. How does the student practice a difficult spot or a passage? So what do you think? H what would most students do with a difficult passage? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. They would just repeat it over and over again, fast, as fast as possible, because they want to be done, right? Um, does the student use a metronome? And how, when and how? Does the student use recording device for their practice sessions? That's for older age. And how involved are the parents in the practice routine? Another question that is very important to ask is how many activities is your child in? Because if a child is 10 years old and he has soccer, football, swim team, piano lessons, I don't know what else, chess club, the chances are no matter how many times you're going to tell the child to practice, they just physically do not have time. So that's something that 
uh, also has to be taken into consideration. Um, so as I said, a glance into their environment, this is my favorite one, when a bear, uh, you don't see the piano here, but a bear is caught on camera uh, playing the piano. This is very important. And there are certain programs actually that can record the practice sessions uh, for your students that I'm talking, I, I will talk about it in a minute. But really not only glancing into their home environment, but how about their sitting posture? Again, if a student comes to you, right, and he's sitting perfectly at your lesson, but you notice that his uh, uh, shoulders are tense, what does it tell you that the sh his shoulders are lifted like this? What could be the reason? He's sitting too low, probably kitchen, uh, kitchen chair or something at home, right? And parents don't know. So just taking a quick picture of their sitting position will give you um, sort of an idea of what's going on at home. Um, the first one I struggle with, I just struggle with that, with my own child, with my students, because I expect so much from them, but have reali realistic expectations and a written policy. But realistic expectations, that is like, you have to know that what takes for you like five minutes for students will take much longer. Ask to create a journal for an older student and actually record what they practice and how they practice. Be specific with their homework, especially at the younger age. The kids will not read a five paragraph homework assignment. You will be lucky if they read it, if it's bullet points. And so um, sometimes when I, well, I don't teach young age anymore, but when I did, I had like an exact paper and I would say, okay, chair knee attitude, concentrating on measures three and four, five times a day. And you mark it, right? Just very, very specific to the point so they know exactly what to do. Video record the lesson and ask to follow. So that could be done with this amazing program, clubroommusic.com. It is free for teachers, but the student uh, pays, I think it's like $10, $10 a month or something like that, maybe less, I don't remember, because it's just a recurring thing. And what happens here is you're recording the lesson and you will tab and you would say, Right now we are practicing Schumann, let's say. And so at, it will be like at minute 15. And so they would go to uh, home, to their homework, and they would say, okay, let me look at what we did with the Schumann piece. And they would go exactly to that tab and they would watch that exact episode. So it takes a little bit away from the lesson, of course, because you have the technology involved. But with some uh, students, it was very uh, useful. Tonara.com, uh, Tonara program is the motivating program. I haven't used that, but I hear great things about it. It's all about practicing and how students practice, and it has to do with technology. Again, if parents approve of technology that could be useful, um, I personally don't, so <laughs> it's kind of hard to advocate for that sometimes with the young children. Okay, so we're going to watch a few examples, and we're just going to talk about them. Um, and you know what, I'm going to give you a handout that I have, so we can kind of look at that and, and see. Let's use this. One, two. Okay, hopefully it will work. Stop, stop. We can just listen to it as well. It is not responding. It's supposed to have, you already know everything I'm going to say. I taught it to them by rote, that's all. Yes, exactly. Um, how do I, why is this not, oh here. I just wanted to do it fast. I just I want us to look at it because of course it will have no 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 stop okay that's the wrong thing I'm like wow this kid sounds better second time through <laughs> okay no that's not right uh Okay, 
let's pause, 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 no, ah, uh, ah, uh. okay. So, so what do you think <laughs> about this? So uh, let's, let's talk from the first, uh, music literacy. So he's playing with music, so we are hopeful that he actually has some music literacy here, right? He is not playing by memory, even though it's not always guaranteed that he actually literal, but at least, okay. Technique, where would you put him? Oh, you know what? I didn't give you a handout, did I? Sorry. I do have plenty. Oh, that I made. Wait. Mm. Can you put it up again? Yes. <laughs> so what? Yeah, you have to watch to, to get the technique. Two, okay. Why? What is he doing wrong? Right, he's pushing his wrist down a lot, right? Yes, exactly. What else does he do wrong? Uh, put it up again for a second. Just show. You don't have to play it, but just right. Oh, there. oh, good. Uh, you know. Look at his fifth finger. Yeah. I don't know, it's kind of blurry, oh, it's hard to, it's hard to, shot. yes, exactly. It looks very flat. And yeah. this is alignment, this is another thing about alignment, is when yeah. you're kind of on the side like this, yeah. yeah, instead it's supposed to be, yeah, yeah more, yeah, yeah. more round. Okay, what can you tell me about his shoulders? It's hard to tell because it's yeah. not, but uh, I'm going to play it so you can kind of see what... <laughs> Yes. Like stiff. Yeah. It is stiff and it's a little bit up. Do you see how he also tries to actually put it down because it looks like he's rotating forward. It he's trying, but he can't do it because he's doing something wrong. So, so many things there are wrong that he cannot do what his teacher is probably asking him to do, which is keep your shoulders down. So he's trying to push those down. Okay, good. So this is one example. Let's see if the second example will be a little bit easier to... Ah, wait, we didn't talk about the, um, the mu musicianship. So what do you think about musicianship? <laughs> just be honest, it's okay, it's not my student. No, <laughs> just <laughs> I'm just joking, but... <laughs> Do I need to put it on one more time? Somewhere between two and three? Yeah. Uh-huh. Somewhere between two and three? Yeah. Okay. So what could we do better? What could be better? Like if he was your student or you had a master class, what would you recommend for him? to do better musically? Technique and phrasing. Music-wise, phrasing. phrasing uh, yeah, they're all the same, right? Yeah. Ex yeah. And yeah. Sometimes it's like the da, 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 I can hear that kind of. So it's like a meter. Yeah. It's very subdivided. Yeah. Right? There is no sense of phrasing at all. Like none. He does not. He doesn't hear it uh, very well. But he's trying really hard. Um, he probably has good practice skills. I'm not sure. It's hard to tell from the video. But this is a cute little waltz from one of the RCM books. So let's look at that. Mm. 
Oh, no, 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 no. We, we heard this enough times. Let's... I thought I did control C. Control V. That did not... I think you need to push the window button instead of the control button. The window button, can you, you help? see at the bottom where there's the little Windows 95 button? No, 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 on the keyboard. 95, but no. The little, it's next to the control button. Ah, this? The window button. Yeah, it doesn't. Instead of the control button. Ah, I see, I see. Oh, that's a new thing, new trick in PC. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. It's a, it's a PC. Yeah. It's a PC no. uh, keyboard on a Mac computer. Oh, okay. Weird. <laughs> I think this is good enough. So um, I'm kind of going to skip music literacy because we don't actually know. But technique and musicianship. So what did you think about technique? So on the back, oh, there's the list of the, of the things you can do. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes. Yes, for example, <laughs> he's giving you hints. I'm going to start it again, or continue it rather. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Uh huh. And like sometimes I can see the rest a little bit up because he needs to yeah. Mm -hmm. the cable. Did you did you notice though how she actually falls down on her thumb? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most of the time it falls down, but sometimes. Mm. Yes. There is also a lot of tension between fingers. I don't know if you noticed. That means like when one finger lifts, the other help that shouldn't be like this. When I lift second finger, the rest of the fingers should not do this. Yeah. So that means that there is somewhere there a lot of tension. Her shoulder is okay, even though she's sitting on the lower side, on the lower end, yeah? But there is definitely, she's trying to control everything manually, and there is a tension here, so she actually stops her weight from going to fingers and having beautiful sound. Yeah, instead you have this kind of, uh, you know, everything just um, quite tense. Okay, how about musically? I'm not going to play it again. I think this is fine. So phrasing, what did you think? Was there phrasing? Don't think that she's, uh, you know, 10 years old. Think that your classmate just played that. You know, <laughs> what would you tell them? <laughs> just, what would you tell them? I want an honest opinion. Was it good? Was it something, would you buy tickets to hear her play? I think the music needs uh, facing contrast and yes. different kind of music instead of Right. Flat. Again, it all sounds the same, yeah, all right? Sounds the same, yeah. What what about balance? Left and too loud. Right, left and is way too loud. Basically, both hands play the same volume, right? Um, anything else that you well, there is no timing. It's just all like very, very straight through, and there is really no ta da da ta da da. There is no flow to music at all. And her legato, the way she plays legato, is it really legato? No, it's not ti ta 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 ti ta 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 ti. You know, it's almost like a sushi rolls. Okay, anyway, <laughs> um, and I have two more.
Let's see if I'll have a better time now. Window C, 29 minutes, 30 seconds. I'll try to find it. Okay. Oh, it's already there. Okay, so this teacher is one of the most amazing teachers in Russia, actually. Her name is Mira Marchenko. She has a lot of uh, master classes online, and I know it's in Russian, but uh, actually it's uh, a lot of it is uh, self-explanatory. You can actually understand what she's saying without understanding really. Um, so this uh, little girl, she's um, five years old or so, right? And um, we're going to listen to Cherny Etude and how it's... This is at the end of her lesson. She's actually quite exhausted at this point. She's only five. Okay, so let's talk about technique first. Yeah. Yeah, for being five, it's pretty, imp it's pretty impressive, right? Yeah. What you, and it's actually pretty good, but there is one thing that could be better. Let's look at this passage. Uh, you, you will see it right away, I'm sure. Uh, oops. Ah, I'll just last. Here. Oh, she's got a little yes. The thumbs thing. She's trying so hard, actually. You can tell that she's a very hard worker, right? And so the thumbs go ta da ti da da ta ti da 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 da. And they're they're trying to like fix. Her hand, when she plays those chords, yeah. Hand. Yeah. yeah. Right. The shape, the shape of the hand. You can tell that the shape of the hand, the shape is in progress. It's not, you know. Yeah. I think she also has the. Combination of the of the finger. Yes. When she played the uh, the ascending lines, like she has this kind of uh, yes, she has strong fingers, and that's kind of what she's working with her on, right? Therefore, this is an attitude. I mean, this is not the most musical thing, and here they're not really working on musicianship, so it's hard to assess the musical uh, side. But I did wanted to 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 show you that. While she's doing really amazing things, there's always room for improvement, right? And that thumb was kind of, yeah, going down. Um, anyway, really great teacher if you can uh, watch her. And last one. Last one. Uh, um, last one. Hopefully you can see. <laughs> okay, etc. I just wanted for you to hear the second time when she repeats. What, do you, what did you think? This kid must has been thinking professionally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah she's, pro she's probably right. She's a little bit older now. She's, I think, even older. Um, now she's a teenager, actually. But yeah, her hands are great. Legato is wonderful, right? What else? The style, mm -hmm. the style, right? Yum, pum, pum, ta, pum, pum, pum. Yeah, you can clearly. Yes, you can clearly tell the style. It's beautiful. The second time when she started playing it, she had a different tone quality. That has something uh, to be said for as well. Good. Okay, wonderful. So, if you would like me to send this lecture to you, or maybe I will, I could sh share it uh, with yeah, you, and then you can. Me, yeah. yeah and you can share the lecture. Um, there are a few more slides there, but I think we're running out of time and I wanted to leave five minutes for questions. So do you have any questions? Just because I wasn't here when you talked about 
Uh huh. You say like in your style versus not in your style. Can you explain that? Yes. So I was uh, talking about how every person is actually taught differently. Mm -hmm. Like I come from Russian school, someone else come from you know China, someone else comes from Germany. Even the German school and Russian are actually closely related. Mm -hmm. um, and so my own style might be different from your style. But if the result is the same, which is healthy, fluent technique that you're able to express whatever you want, then I let it go. Okay. And I found that uh, in the rare cases that I have students like that, that are beautiful, just fluent technique, everything, and did not come from my school at all, because I show a lot in my lesson, they actually uh, <laughs> usually you know, imitate what I do, and they slowly go to my uh, side. <laughs> yeah, so that's okay. what it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Can you talk about, since you were talking about transfer students, talk about the time frame that this all takes place over? Yes, so that is one of my next slides, and because you don't oh, have, yeah, okay. because you don't have um, questions, maybe I could just go a little far farther or not. Here we go. So so yes, I'm done now, what, what do I do? Um, and so you inform the family um, of uh, several, there are several options. Option one is actually accepting the students. And uh, what you do, you discuss the square one assessment with the parent or with the student, telling them, okay, here's what I think. Do you think you would like to commit to that? And this is very important because that way you actually get them on your side from day one. Okay, and then um, you create a plan for that student trying to fix all those various things um, or just going forward with, you know, from whatever um, they stopped. Set short and long term goals. Short uh, goal might be because you didn't practice prior to, my, to entering my studio, I want you to record every practice session for, you know, three months now. And if you do that, you know, great, uh, then you continue being in my studio. And then include a timeline when the student will be re-evaluating, re-evaluated, because you do want to tell them, okay, you're accepted, but I still might re-evaluate you. Like, are you following everything that I'm asking you to do? So this is the best case scenario. The second one is similar to the first one, but it's where you don't really know. This is usually what I do now, regardless of, like if I'm interested in a student that contacts me, I just, I go through the assessment, I tell them everything that I think needs to be, you know, fixed or improved or where we go from now on, from now on and I give them one semester, um, like a, tri a trial period. So like that 15 year old boy that I told you about, he actually did not last. <laughs> we did not work together because he was convinced that he can play list transcendental etude without playing any Cherny etudes before that or scales. Uh, so, you know, it's a relationship. Teacher has to match uh, well with the student. And then the option three is actually not accepting the student. And sometimes I do that as well. Um, I try to just manage my time very carefully at this point. And whenever I actually tell the student that I'm sorry, at the moment I'm not a good fit for you, I actually recommend them to another teacher. I don't want them to feel bad. I just say, okay, that's okay. For now, you can study with one of my students, for example, right? But if you want to, you can come back to me in six months or a year and we will um, revisit that. So that's basically what it is. Um, it is an overwhelming kind of thing to build that kind of assessment. So I still build my own and I add things slowly as I get new students. So of course the key line, the, the, the key component, it's slowly, right? Every time when you think about, okay, how you teach is slowly. And the way I started it, I actually did it with my current students when I was teaching, like years ago, <laughs> little students. I just evaluated my own studio, where should eight-year-old be after two years, where should 10-year-old be after four years, etc. And that's how I build my own assessment for studio. Good. Did that answer mm -hmm. the, the, que the question? Yeah. Any other questions? How much time would you allow between like the assessment and then the discussing the assessment? 
like a week. Okay. Yeah. I don't like to give a lot of time because then, first of all, I might forget. Yeah. It's not fresh, mm -hmm. and I like to uh, to assess it like fast. Yeah. Not at the same point. Not not the same day because I need time to actually think about it. But within a few days or a week. And do you usually like set up another meeting time, or do you? I do. Okay. I do. I actually never do it through email because it's just very impersonal. Mm -hmm. um, especially if I tell them that I cannot accept them. Right. I mean, it's just not, yeah. Mm -hmm. Those people usually will be the ones who will go to concerts. So, you know, you don't want to treat them <laughs> badly. You want to be kind to them because they, they should continue studying. You just might not be that choice, the, the perfect match.